I'm going to start with a key question here tonight. How do these properties of our solar system explain, number one, its formation, and number two, its history? This will be an ongoing question that we're going to be talking about tonight as we go through our discussion. Again, we want to explain, we want to understand, we want to have a deeper knowledge of our solar system. Let's begin with the motions of the large bodies in the solar system. Here you see a little animation showing the planets circling around the sun. We take it for granted that the planets orbit in the same direction and they orbit in the same plane. My students could tell you that's called the ecliptic. Maybe you've heard that term. Interestingly, the planets also rotate in that same direction. If we're looking down at the North Pole of the sun here, that would be counterclockwise. Even further, the moons of the solar system orbit their planets in the same direction and in the same plane. And those moons rotate in the same direction with only very few exceptions. So this may seem unimportant, but really it's telling us something. This is not random motion, is it? We don't have objects flying all over the solar system in various directions. There's a measure of order even here. And again, it may seem small, but it certainly is significant for us to take note of. Number two, the location of objects in the solar system. I've already mentioned that the rocky or the terrestrial planets are rocky in nature and they are closer to the sun. You see them in the upper right here. On the other hand, the Jovian planets are gaseous in nature and they are farther from the sun. And in recent years, you might know we've discovered icy dwarf planets that are smaller, but they are also farther from the sun being icy. So again, these may seem like small things, but they are significant. We can take them as the first facts, the first building blocks, so to speak, and build our understanding as we move forward now. Okay, so we're kind of getting some basics down. Let's finish up with the smaller bodies of the solar system. If you look over towards the left here, the asteroids you might know are small rocky objects. They're in the inner solar system. And yet comets and Kuiper Belt objects off to the right there are in the outer solar system. So you're probably already noticing the pattern. You're probably already noticing the pattern of what types of objects are in different regions of the solar system. And this again, is significant. Whoops. So there's my second question. Let's go back as we talked about these properties explaining the formation of the solar system. That's what I'd like to do now is address that understanding, our understanding of the formation of the solar system. We begin with what's known as the nebular theory. And this basically states that our solar system formed from a huge cloud of gas and dust out in space. And you see an example of one here in the upper right. I'm going to break this down into just three basic steps. There's far more detail, of course, but number one, you might think, well, where did this come from? The material or the matter in these clouds that we see in space was ejected into space by earlier generations of stars that lived before our sun. That matter eventually would gather together under the force of gravity. And as you see in our second step here, that cloud now would begin slowly to contract and fragment into smaller sections. These smaller sections then would eventually become solar systems. So in other words, a solar system doesn't just form all by itself out in space, but it generally forms from one of these gigantic clouds and numerous such solar systems can form. We're going to talk for a few minutes now about the next steps as each of these fragments contracts. You can imagine, obviously, that most of the material is going to be collected towards the center and form a young star, such as our sun. Our sun holds over 99% of the matter in our solar system. But notice there that flattened disk of material around it. Well, to you and me, that's pretty important because that's where the planets are going to form. Okay, so this is our first few steps. We look out into space today, we see these enormous clouds, all at various stages of development. And again, astronomers have been able to build a picture of how they gradually form solar systems. So let's get into that. How exactly does this happen? 
three things are gonna happen to our cloud in particular that I'm gonna talk about for a minute. Number one, as it contracts, it's gonna heat up. Picture it this way, all the many, many trillions and trillions and trillions of little particles in that cloud have a tiny bit of gravity that they're gonna exert on each other. And that cloud's gonna slowly contract over long periods of time. As those particles get closer together, their gravitational attraction is gonna cause them all to speed up just a little bit. Well, that speeding up could be considered a form of energy. Some of you may be familiar with the term potential energy. In other words, as the particles are at great distances from the center, they have the potential to speed up. They have the potential to release energy. And so the point is, as the clouds contract, those particles get closer and they speed up, their potential energy changes to thermal energy. And that word sounds exactly what we mean. Thermal energy implies heat, doesn't it? We could just think of it in those terms. Number two, our cloud is gonna to begin to spin faster. Why would it do that? Well, first of all, our cloud's never gonna be perfectly motionless, is it? It's gonna have some random motions. And as it contracts, there's a law of physics that states it will spin faster. It has to do with what's called angular momentum. We're familiar with momentum in a straight line. Driving our car on an icy road, we're concerned how much momentum it might have. But here we're talking about rotational momentum. Why would the cloud begin to spin faster? Well, we often use this illustration. Maybe you've seen ice skaters on television and these young athletes often go flying down the ice. When they go into a spin, they have their arms extended, don't they? But what happens when they pull those arms in closer to their body? They spin much faster, don't they? This is because their size, or we could call it their radius has decreased and therefore the spin velocity increases. Well, crudely speaking, the same principle applies here. As our cloud shrinks smaller, it's going to spin faster. I'm sorry, I can't put it into animation here for you to show you that, but I think you get the sense from our pictures. Number three, our cloud's gonna flatten. Why is it gonna do that? Well, think of again, all the various material, the particles falling inwardly in a spherical shape, Particles near the top and bottom of the cloud are free to fall inwardly, but those perpendicular to the spin axis at 90 degrees, they're gonna feel an outward centrifugal force from the spin. And that is gonna hamper them from falling inwardly, isn't it? And so preferentially, the contraction will be greater from the top and bottom than it will be from the sides. And thus we're gonna end up with a flattened disk. So these are well-known principles of physics that have been verified long ago in many different aspects, but do you see how we're using the laws of physics, the principles, to begin to explain how a solar system could form? We're, we're keeping it simple, of course, but I think you get the picture here. That is how we can do that. Okay, so we've got a first idea, don't we, of this enormous cloud out in space, and it's contracting going to heat up, it's going to spin faster, it's going to flatten. Can we confirm this? This all sounds good, right? But scientists are very keen on having evidence for the things we believe. We need to be able to confirm that in some way. Can we do that? Well, as a matter of fact, we can. This picture not only sounds good, but we have seen examples of it out in space. Let me take you for a visit to the well-known Orion Nebula. Maybe you've seen a picture of this here in the upper left. And some of those small squares you see there are showing close-up views of young stars forming. We know that this is an area in space where stars are forming. And when we zoom in, we see these interesting structures. They're now called proplids or protoplanetary disks. This is exactly what we just described. A young star is surrounded by a disk of material that is rotating around it and is flattening. So this is good evidence, this is good confirmation that our theory is on the right track. Down in the lower right, you see a few more close-ups of some of them. And of course, we're viewing some at different angles, different perspectives, but generally speaking, they look very much like what we would expect. Again, this gives us confidence that our theory is on the right track. 
So we've painted a broad picture here, of course, just going into the basics of how gravity and other principles of physics apply and how they can be used to really learn to understand how the solar system could have formed. Well, of course, there's much more we want to learn, isn't there? Let's press on a little bit. Notice on the left here some more recent pictures of these disks. These are spectacular in detail, aren't they? We can see much finer close-up detail in these. These were taken, as you see here, by the Atacama Large Millimeter Array. Just a few years ago, this was put in operation, 66 radio telescopes out in the desert of Chile, observing at millimeter and submillimeter wavelengths. By having 66 radio telescopes, we can link them all together and get this exquisite resolution. We can see extraordinary detail in these disks of material. This is continuing to help us greatly increase, expand, and improve our understanding of these disks. Now, of course, we've described how gravity is really the driving force here, but notice what you see in many of these. You see rings and gaps of material. What's going on? Well, as we're gonna talk about now for a few minutes, these gaps are where the planets are forming. The rings are the material that is still orbiting around the young star that has not yet formed into a planet. So when we see the rings and gaps, that's dramatic evidence of planetary formation. So ALMA has been a powerful tool in recent years. One of the reasons I decided to go ahead and discuss this topic was some of the extraordinary images that we are getting back. Let's zoom in and take an even closer look at a few of these and we'll talk a little bit more about them. On their left, you see several that have been well studied because they are prime examples of what we want to learn to test our theories. Okay, on the lower right, you can see a little animation here I'll play for you. If you could somehow magically sit around for millions of years and watch this disk change, this is kind of what you'd see. Gradually, the uniformity of the disk would change into these gaps and rings. This is, our, again, our evidence, our support that planets are forming. And again, as we look at numerous ones, we see them at different stages of development. I often say it's a little bit like if you looked at 100 different human beings, you'd see all different ages. You could kind of figure out the life cycle of a human being, couldn't you? From childhood to adolescence to young adult to middle age and senior citizen, you wouldn't have to sit around for 80 years to figure out a human life cycle. Well, it's kind of similar with stars and other objects. We see different objects at different stages of development, and we can piece that together and learn about that. Okay, well, you can see again how this works, and again, how some of the recent results, as I said, are improving our understanding, but here's our next big question, as you see. What about the temperature? And what I mean by that is, if a planet is forming in this disk, and it's closer, to the young sun or farther from the young sun. What effect will that have? Let's talk about that for a few minutes, okay? We're gonna take two different examples here. Number one, it's pretty obvious. You see here a graph showing temperature graphed from a young star like our sun, perhaps farther outward. Inner regions of that disk, simply put, are gonna be hotter than the outer regions. They're closer to the young star. They're gonna absorb more energy, aren't they? All right, well, here's our first key point. The higher temperatures closer to the star are going to vaporize the gas and ice that might be present in the disk. The disk is composed of many different types of materials, some gas, some ice, some rock, some metals. Well, if you're too close to that young sun, the extra heat is gonna vaporize the gas and ice, drive it out of that inner solar system and only rock and metal can remain. We know they have a much higher temperature that they can survive. You can easily melt an ice cube with a, you know, a flame, but you can't really melt a rock very easily, can you? Okay, so the point is this. We picture now our disk of material, and at a certain distance from the young sun, if we're inside that distance, there's only rock and metal with which to form planets. We call that distance the frost line. Sometimes it's called the ice line or the snow line, but you get the idea. 
So only rocky planets can form close to the sun inside that frost line because that's the only type of material that's available. What about outside the frost line? Well, there we would have gas and ice still present with which to build planets. So again, you can see that that early observation we made, it seems simple at the time, that we have four rocky terrestrial worlds close to our sun, four icy and gaseous worlds farther from the sun. Here's how we can explain it. Why is it like that? In other words, we don't see Jupiter orbiting where Venus is, and we don't see the Earth orbiting where Saturn is. No, we have four rocky bodies near the sun, four gaseous bodies farther from the sun because of temperature. Okay, so we've established now, again, much of the formation, but there's more we want to discuss. Let's take one more quick look at our concept of the frost line. Once again, inside the frost line, it's too hot for gas and ice. There's only going to be rock and metal. Outside the frost line, however, it is cold enough. There will be gas and ice available to build planets. By the way, picture too that outside that frost line, farther and farther away from the sun, you have a much greater volume of space than you have inside. And so therefore you have a much greater amount of material with which to build planets. We'll talk about this a little more later, but think about why those four inner rocky planets are relatively lower in mass compared to those four outer gaseous planets that have much more mass. Inside of the orbit, let's say of Jupiter, there's so three, four, five times the mass of Earth. Outside the orbit of Jupiter, there's several hundred times the mass of Earth. So again, you can envision in that early solar system, there would be so much more matter, so much more material with which to build planets outside the frost line. By the way, you can see here too, what we call the rock metal line. And you can see it's quite close to our sun. If material is inside that, close distance from the sun, it's going to be too hot even for rock and metal. There will come a point at which the extreme intense heat of that young star will vaporize even rock and metal, many thousands of degrees. So surely we're not going to expect to form planets there, are we? Okay, so we're building a good picture here, aren't we? And again, for many years, scientists have done this and have worked through this nebular theory of the solar system's formation. Well, these questions seem to keep popping up. How do planets form? It's easy to say, well, you know, we're going to form planets, but how? Let's talk about that for a minute. What's the process of planetary formation? My students have been learning a little bit about this in recent weeks. The name of the process is accretion. So let me talk about this for a minute. Accretion basically states that essentially smaller particles in that disk are going to start to stick together. Kind of like snowflakes on a snowy day, those kind of stick together, but this is going to go much, much further, okay? These particles are going to stick together, and as they do so, they'll kind of grow a little larger, grow a little larger, and after they get a few tens of feet across, they're beginning to accumulate enough matter that they have a little bit of gravity. They can now begin to pull in a little bit more material and more and more gradually, as you kind of see here in the lower right, these three images. And as they became hundreds of feet, thousands of feet, maybe a few miles across, well, they're not particles anymore. We begin to call them planetesimals. They're certainly not planets yet either, but they're kind of that in-between size, anywhere from maybe you know, a few hundred feet up to many tens, maybe even hundreds of miles across. Planetesimals then would form over time in our early solar system. Well, you can see the final step there as well. Of course, you can imagine sooner or later, many of these planetesimals, tens of miles across, are gonna to collide together. And many, if not most of those are gonna to stick together. They're gonna to collide at relatively low enough velocity. They're not gonna necessarily smash each other apart. They're gonna to stick together. And that's gonna form even larger objects that eventually are gonna grow in size to become planets. You can see another artist illustration at the upper left there, showing, again, a young planet 
with all these various objects, now that planet has acquired enough mass to have a significant gravity, it can pull in more matter and grow in size. Let me show this little animation here while I'm talking. Again, if we were somehow able to sit back and watch the disk over long periods of time, we mentioned those rings of material, those gaps. Watch closely in the gaps. You'll begin to see, as they're just illustrating, of course, one to the upper right, one to the lower left, notice how the planets are becoming more and more visible in these areas. They are collecting more of this matter. They are accreting matter, we would say, and growing in size. Of course, this process takes time, but we are now finding evidence for this process again in other solar systems. Gradually, slowly, the dust and other material in that disk is gonna gradually dissipate much of it is going to be gathered into planets. Some of it will eventually be dispersed by that young star as it begins generating more energy. And eventually, as you can see there, you're gonna end up with a star circled by planets. So accretion is a very important process. Interestingly, in recent years, this was even tested on a very small scale granted, but it was tested Astronauts in orbit took a container. Of course, in orbit, they have very little, if any, gravity there. And the point is, this container of particles slowly showed this process. Particles did begin to stick together, random collisions. Even over a very short time of a few weeks, they could see the particles begin this accretion of clumping together into larger ones. So interesting how we can even do a very sh short, small scale test, but see the beginnings of how this process would have worked. You can well imagine at the very end there, as that upper left picture shows, there's gonna be some pretty good size impacts of pretty good sized bodies, maybe some miles across crashing into a young planet. Eventually, that planet again grows to a certain size. There of course would come a point at which many of these objects are finally, as we said, gathered into planets. And the rate of the impacts is gonna decrease. Notice how they've also illustrated the planet as being very, very hot, almost a molten surface. Well, every one of those impacts brings tremendous energy that heats up the rock. My students can tell you that's the kinetic energy as it crashes into the planet, heating up the lava. Again, those objects far from the center are trading their potential energy or kinetic energy, and it turns into thermal energy. Gradually, the young planet's surface is going to cool, it's going to harden, and we go forward from there. So accretion is our explanation of how planets form. And again, we're just now getting to the point where we're able to see such things around other stars. Well, that brings us to what we see today. As we've described already, we started out with a picture of today's solar system. And you can see how the process leads up to it. Now we have the rock metal particles inside the frost line forming those planetesimals. Those planetesimals build larger planets such as Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. Out past the frost line, much more gas and ice present out there. Greater quantities build bigger planets, don't they? Many more icy planetesimals. We often use those terms interchangeably. You can see I, I say gas and ice a lot together. It really depends on the temperature. And so again, as these larger planets grew, they could draw on more material, grow even larger. And thus we end up with much larger planets outside that frost line. So as I mentioned at the outset, you can see how we can take simple facts and gradually build them into a better, deeper understanding of what we see today. And scientists, like to put together theories in this way, again, as I said, that explain what we see. By the way, if you're wondering about the various large moons of the outer solar system, maybe you know Jupiter has four large moons, Saturn has several, even Uranus and Neptune, how do we account for them? Well, simply put, with so much material in the outer solar system, when those large planets were forming, there was so much material, they would form their own disk of material around them, kind of like a miniature version of the sun's disk of material. And again, a 
accretion would take place here. Smaller objects would start collecting together, building bigger ones. And again, simply put, this is how we would form large moons around the Jovian planets. Interestingly, we don't see that around the four terrestrial worlds, do we? Mercury, Venus, Mars, they don't have large moons. Now, Earth is an exception to that. We do have a large moon. But that's another story. Let's save that for another time, how Earth's moon formed. Notice again, as I said, how the outer Jovian planets had so much material with which to work with, they could build these large moons. Those moons out there, by the way, are roughly the size of our moon, maybe a little bit larger, a little bit smaller. But that's how we account for these moons of the Jovian planets. We also can take a better look, a more accurate look at those asteroids and comets that I briefly mentioned. Here you see some pictures on the left of an asteroid taken by a spacecraft. Looks like a giant rock in space. Well, it would be correct to essentially call that a leftover planetesimal. In other words, here we're looking at an object that never did finish forming a planet. You might know there's many, many asteroids orbiting between Mars and Jupiter. Many of them look a lot like this, some a little larger, some a little smaller, but the point is these are leftover rocky planetesimals that never formed a planet. Likewise with comets. Now, of course, we love to see the bright tail here, but you probably know that comets really are small, relatively small chunks of ice. And when they come near the sun and warm up, then we see the tail form, but when they're far from the sun, they're essentially like an asteroid, only they're made of ice. Once again, that fits well, doesn't it? That fits well with our description of what we just said. Out beyond the frost line, you're going to have a lot of ice, as I said. These would also be planetesimals that never formed a planet out there. So you begin to see again how all the pieces fit together into a coherent picture. Scientists have understood this basic picture for some time, but as I said, we continue to try to improve it, enlarge it, expand it, and learn more. Well, when did this happen? That's an interesting question. How could we know the age of a planet? Let me start off by saying that it would make sense to assume, until proven otherwise, that the planets all formed at roughly the same time. You saw that they form from this large disk of material and they would have formed at the same time. So we'll take that as a first assumption. There's no reason not to think that. But as it says here, we can determine the age of a planet using the age of its rocks. And the method, as you see here, is called radiometric dating. Let me talk a little bit about this graph. This graph is showing how the element potassium-40 changes over time into the element argon-40. How does it do that? Well, radioactive decay means that different atomic processes happen, but for our purposes, we're more interested in how this happens over time. Notice, for example, over 1.25 billion years, potassium-40 changes to argon in a 50-50 ratio. In other words, if you could somehow, I'll just keep this simple, manage to find a rock that was half potassium, half argon. You could safely assume that that rock was 1.25 billion years old because that's how long it took half of the potassium to change into argon. Now there are other such elements that go through this. This is just one that we've chosen to illustrate and it happens to have the right time frame for us to use when we talk about planets. Notice too, after 2.5 billion years, now half of the remaining half has changed. In other words, we're down to 25% potassium, 75% argon. We would call that two half-lives have expired. So again, if you somehow magically got your hands on a rock that was 25% potassium and 75% argon, you could safely assume it was 2.5 billion years old and so forth. Three half-lives, four half-lives. So geologists over the years have gotten quite good at this, of course, being able to carefully and very specifically measure these amounts, these relative amounts in various rocks 
and they can tell us how old these rocks are. Okay, what have we found? Well, you can see here, earth rocks at their oldest have been found to be about 3.8 billion years old. That's pretty long, okay? When our astronauts went to the moon way back in the 1970s, they brought back some samples that were as old as 4.4 billion years old. You might know we also receive a steady stream of meteorites from outer space. Rocks fall from the sky. We pick them up, we analyze them, we learn about them. That's another whole story. But some of the oldest ones of those are about 4.5 billion years old. So as you can see, we put then the time of planet formation, not quite 4.6 billion years ago. That's a long time, isn't it? 4,600 million years ago. The Earth and the other planets essentially were finishing that accretion. They were cooling and solidifying. And that's when this clock starts, this clock of elements changing from one to the other. The reason the Earth's rocks are not quite as old is you probably know Earth's surface has a lot of activity over that period of time. There's volcanism, there's erosion, there's tectonics. So a lot of Earth's rocks have been altered, but the moon rocks have not been. And those meteorites have not been. And that's why if we think, well, maybe they're just these rocks flying around in space, they're not all that interesting. Actually, they are. Those asteroids that you saw pictures of a minute ago, these meteorites, they are very valuable to scientists who want to study the formation of the solar system. They give us, again, the age of when this happened. Well, we have, I think, established and developed a pretty good understanding of our solar system, but here's a fair question. How about other solar systems? You probably know that we've been finding planets around other stars. I have an entire lecture on that. If you'd like to find that on YouTube, go out there and learn about extrasolar planets. What a fascinating field that has turned into be. So while I certainly can't go into all of that in this lecture, I do wanna draw in a few points from that to again, help us understand our solar system better. It's again, a bigger sample size. If we only study one solar system, we're gonna have a very limited understanding, aren't we? Sometimes I illustrate that by saying, well, if a sociologist wanted to know about humans and you only interviewed one person, well, you learned something about that specific person, their life, their environment, their upbringing, you know, other such factors. But if you interviewed hundreds or maybe even thousands of people, well, of course, you're gonna see much greater variety, aren't you? So many different variations, that's exactly what we have found by now investigating, examining, analyzing other solar systems. So if that interests you, again, go, go find that other lecture on extrasolar planets. But for now, I wanna key in on one main point here <clears throat> that's very important in our discussion tonight. What have we found from them? This could be a little surprising. Other solar systems show evidence of dramatic changes. And the reason I think that might be surprising is because we tend to have the assumption that our solar system formed as we described it and has not significantly changed. We kind of picture it as always being the way it is today. Well, that may or may not be true. Let's talk a little bit about this. Let's go back for a minute to what we described with the nebular theory, right? We said, well, the gas planets, Jupiter and Saturn and those, they cannot form inside that frost line. It's too warm all the ice and gas are vaporized, but that's exactly what we have found around other stars. Look at this diagram. At the top is our solar system, and they're kind of showing you the relative distances of Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. Notice these other systems, there are very large planets such as Jupiter very close to their stars. These have been called hot Jupiters. Boy, were these a shock 20, 25 years ago. We did not expect this because the nebular theory said it shouldn't happen. How do you get a gas Jovian planet this close to its sun? It just doesn't seem like it should happen. Well, the simple answer is since they can't form there, they must have moved there. Planetary orbits must change. Now we're very used to, of course, 
Earth's orbit, for example, being very stable. Don't worry, there's no danger of it changing anytime soon. But here's evidence. Those planets could not form that close to their stars, and yet there they are. How do we explain that? As I go through this, I want you to think about the fact that we had a good nebular theory, but here it's being challenged, isn't it? This is often how science works. We have a good theory, but when we learn more, one of a few things can happen. Either you have to discard the theory, it's just plain wrong, or sometimes the theory gets better. So watch for that as I now go ahead and explain how we've done that. Okay, you see these hot Jupiters orbiting close to their stars. How do you move a planet? <laughs> it's a good question. Normally, as I said, planets are going to orbit around their star unless, unless there is a very powerful force to move them, just as an object normally doesn't move unless you apply a force to it, does it? Okay, so how do you move a planet? Well, you can probably guess it's going to include gravity. Let me describe these two diagrams you see on the right here. Look at our first diagram. You notice as we've described a gap in the disk. And notice in the red there, you see a little planet is, is symbolized. It has accreted, it has gathered material from around its orbit. It's orbiting around its sun. Notice how the disk though, has more material outside of the planet's orbit than inside. And by the way, disks are not lime green, don't worry. But the point here is there's much more material outside the planet than inside. Well, you can probably guess more material outside has more gravity, stronger gravity than the material inside. In other words, the planet is going to feel a greater gravitational attraction from the material outside the orbit then inside, what's the effect of that going to be? As it says here, it's going to reduce the planet's angular momentum. It's going to migrate inward. So you can probably see where I'm going here. Picture now a young Jovian planet forms outside the frost line, as it should. But over time, this disk of material essentially robs it of energy, and it falls inwardly to a closer orbit. That's one good way to explain how you can get a hot Jupiter orbiting close to its star. The second way you see in the lower right involves multiple planets. Now, again, in our solar system, we're not used to the planets really affecting each other very much, but this is what we've learned from other extrasolar systems. There are times when planets can have a significant effect on each other. Their gravitational encounters result in the change of orbits. They transfer angular momentum. Why do I emphasize transfer? Because one can gain angular momentum at the expense of the other. In other words, as it says, one enlarges the planet's orbit, maybe even ejects it out of the solar system, the other falls inwardly. So picture now, over time as planets interact, this may happen quickly or slowly, by the way, but essentially what you get is one planet migrating inward while one planet migrates out. So again, when astronomers first discovered these hot Jupiters, we had to go back and figure out what could explain them. These two models do that. There are several other ways I won't get into. They're a lot more complicated. And you see here the third point as well. Smaller bodies like asteroids and comets can also be part of this. In other words, even though they're smaller, less massive, they will have some effect on planets. And of course, the planet will have a great effect on a much smaller asteroid or comet, often it will fling it outwardly to greater distances. So you can see again how we can develop an explanation of a seemingly strange fact that there are these hot Jupiters. Notice my conclusion here. The nebular theory is now improved. It explains more than just our solar system. It can explain how there can be hot Jupiters. So many planetary astronomers are hard at work using this new insight to not only examine and analyze, but to understand other solar systems. This makes our solar system seem pretty stable, doesn't it? And it is, even friendly, I would call it. It makes it just right for us, doesn't it? But 
Has it always been that way? In other words, could this have happened to our solar system? Well, you can probably guess where I'm going. It seems very possible. Again, planetary scientists have been hard at work analyzing and investigating if this may have happened. I'm gonna share with you some of their latest results now on what we think may well have happened to our solar system in the past, earlier in the solar system. Let's go back to this idea of planetary migration. Start at the top with me here, part A. We start with that early solar system. We see some of the rocky planets to the left and the Jovian planets. We see a lot of material in the outer solar system, but Jupiter and Saturn are the major players. As they grew larger, more massive, they're accreting more and more material. They're gonna open gaps in the disk, right? Well, the gravity of the disk we said a few minutes ago can move planets inwardly. As Jupiter and Saturn are moving in, they're scattering planetesimals. They may absorb a few of them, but their gravity is going to accelerate those objects and fling them outward, okay? Some in towards the sun, some outer, out of the solar system entirely. Okay, notice in frame number two there, or B, again, you see a very different solar system, don't you? You see Jupiter and Saturn in closer, that inner solar system is much more compressed, that outer solar system, we have a big gap there. Interestingly, when Jupiter and Saturn, again, scattered or threw a lot of these objects out of the inner solar system, that has shared or shed some insight into Mars. You see my comment here, the reduction of inner solar system mass by Jupiter explains the small Mars problem. What's the small Mars problem? Well, it's just that. Do you ever wonder why Mars is smaller than Earth? Why it's smaller than Venus? Mercury is another question so close to the sun, we can explain its smaller size. There's no reason Mars shouldn't be as big as Earth except for this scenario. So in other words, picture again, as Jupiter moves in, it's flinging a lot of material out of the inner solar system at the expense of Mars. It does not have as much material with which to grow larger and larger, <clears throat> okay? It also stirs up what now eventually becomes the asteroid belt and prevents much of that material from forming a planet. So you can see how planetary migration helps us explain the possibility that this occurred in our solar system. Let's take one more step here into gravitational encounters. Turns out that when scientists model this, we can build a model, run that through a computer and watch what happens. We notice that invariably Saturn and Jupiter get a little too close. They form what's called an orbital resonance. And what that means is that gravity is affecting each other. I'll give you a simple example. If Jupiter were to orbit around the sun three times, in the same amount of time that it takes Saturn to orbit two times, every so often, periodically, they would line up and they would give each other a pretty good tug. So we call that a resonance. Well, this orbital resonance means they're affecting each other and they're gonna gradually migrate back outward, as you see there in frame C. Now, as they move outward, they also begin to encounter numerous small objects, those planetesimals, they fling a lot of those outwardly, some inwardly. But interestingly, this also helps us explain something. Maybe you've heard this term, the Oort cloud. The Oort cloud essentially is made of small icy objects such as comets at unimaginably vast distances from the sun. You know, we generally use the astronomical unit as a distance measurement in our solar system. Earth is one astronomical unit from the sun. Jupiter is about five, Saturn's about 10. Well, these objects in the Oort cloud can be thousands of astronomical units away. how did they get out so far? The disk originally was probably not quite that big. So how'd they get out there? This is explained. If Jupiter and Saturn's gravity flung them out there. And when I say that picture, again, these small objects coming near Jupiter or Saturn at various angles, various inclinations, they might not crash into Jupiter, but Jupiter's gravity can accelerate them and fling them outwards. So this helps us explain how the Oort cloud may well have formed. Finally, of course, you can see in the bottom frame, the planets assume their current locations. You have four rocky terrestrial worlds, 
have an asteroid belt, Jupiter, Saturn, and much farther out now would be Uranus and Neptune. So you can see how at least it's plausible at minimum that these two processes could have shaped our solar system as well and explain why it looks the way it is today. Okay. Once again, fair question, is there any support for this? Well, I started to allude to the fact that scientists have investigated this possibility in some detail. I'm gonna just make a few remaining comments here on that latest research, okay? And while I will say it's not 100% proven and agreed upon, there's a lot of consensus. There's a lot of support that we're on the right track here still. Okay, so let's take a little bit more detailed look at how these things may have played out. <clears throat> the first model is called the Grand Tack model. And it's similar to what I just described. It pictures Jupiter forming at about 3.5 AU from the sun, migrating inwardly to where Mars now orbits, about 1.5. Then as we talked about, Jupiter and Saturn affect each other and migrate back outward until Jupiter arrives at its current orbit of about 5.2 astronomical units, okay? We already explained how that would have greatly been possible. And we also explained how that disk would be reshaped. In other words, Jupiter is gonna stir up the inner solar system, isn't it? It's gonna reduce the material available from Mars. It's gonna prevent many, what we now call asteroids, from forming a planet. I didn't mention it in detail, let me just quickly say, Jupiter's gravity prevents those asteroids because they're in a resonance. And so Jupiter does not allow all of them to collect together and accrete together. So today's asteroid belt has a smaller mass than it probably did originally, a much wider range of orbits. And here's an intriguing thought. We think now, it's becoming more and more likely that we think objects not only from inside the frost line, but even outside Jupiter's orbit could well have found their way. And I'll come back to that in a minute, as you see here possible origin of large objects like Ceres. I'll come back to that in just a minute here. So this is the Grand Tack model. You can see the paper that I referenced there where they explain the details of this. Again, scientists often will run numerical simulations and they'll feed into the computer, well, if the solar system had this much mass and you ran it forward for this amount of time, what would happen? Oh, this would happen or that would happen. This is one of the better models that work very well and match our observations, match what we've learned. So we think it very likely this may well have happened early in the solar system's history. There's also the Nice model developed near the French town of Nice. This came a little bit later, we think. The solar system would have been restructured sometime after its formation, probably a little bit later than the Grand Tack model. Here, Jupiter starts out farther from the sun. Saturn, Neptune, and Uranus are closer than their current orbits. There may have even been the possibility of a fifth Jovian planet. Isn't that intriguing? It's no longer with us. How can that be? Well, I mentioned earlier that gravitational interactions can literally eject a planet, if not completely, out to vast distances. Okay, well, in this model, you can see three simple diagrams here, starting on the left before the Jupiter-Saturn resonance. In the middle, there's a scattering of objects that are out beyond Neptune. That's called the Kuiper Belt objects. And then finally, many of those Kuiper Belt bodies end up being ejected, okay? So you can see here, the solar system not quite as stable or serene as maybe we once envisioned. Now, granted, this was a long time ago, hundreds of millions of years ago, but it does paint a very interesting picture, right? Jupiter moving inwardly, Okay, possible ejection of a Jovian planet. This model usually also requires that Uranus and Neptune swap orbits. How about that? And again, as I just described, the disruption of a lot of this material <clears throat> would have resulted in the formation, not only of that Oort cloud I talked about earlier, but this Kuiper belt. These are bodies that are out beyond Neptune, if you're not familiar with that term. Let me do this. I want to share with you an animation. And if you notice up at the top here, the millions of years are just flying by of the Nice model. I'm going to try to pause it right about 900 million years after the formation of the solar system. And the reason I want to do that is because things happen real quickly. 
Okay, so we're at about 684, 700. Let's get into the 800s. Whoops, I went too far. I knew I could do it. Sorry about that. Let me bring us back up here. Now, notice before I started, these four colored circles, those green outer objects are again, planetesimals out beyond the inner solar system. These are those icy planetesimals. Okay, let's go forward from 800 million years. Red is Jupiter, gold is Saturn, blue is Neptune, gray is Uranus. So if those two sound backwards, that's because they are. Let's watch and see if I can do this properly. We get up to about 840. <clears throat> and what happens here is a very small initial effect grows into a much bigger effect. I keep doing that. I'm sorry. Let me try that again. <laughs> One more try. It's a little tricky to get it right where I want it. Okay, let's try that one more time. 8.30. Watch closely what happens very quickly, as I said. Let me back one more time. See if I can't get that to slow down. 858 million years. I can just do it. Notice there, the orbit of Neptune has shifted. You see that? That's going to have a tremendous effect. I can just go forward, especially on those outer bodies in the outer solar system. It's only been a few million years, but notice how quickly they really make a mess of the outer solar system, don't they? And if you notice right here, you see now Neptune in blue has moved out beyond Uranus. Eventually, gradually, all the action settles down, sorry, and we are left really with our solar system as we know it today with the planets in their proper position, far fewer objects than originally were there. So sorry about the animation, but the point here is small, modest orbital changes grow in their effect and greatly disrupt the orbits of the Jovian planets. Those changes in Jovian planet orbits then disrupt all the smaller bodies, the Kuiper Belt and Oort Cloud objects. Now details are still being worked out as you can see here, but I think you get the idea. This was a pretty dramatic time period in our solar system. It has long since settled down. And again, I wanna reassure you, it's perfectly safe now, okay? So don't worry too much about that. Well, one final piece of support I'll finish up here with, I mentioned earlier, is the minor planet Ceres. Now, interestingly, we've always viewed Ceres as the largest asteroid, and it is. It's in the asteroid belt, but, some years back, maybe you know, NASA sent a spacecraft called Dawn to visit Ceres and had some surprises. Scientists always say that's why we go for the surprises. We would think that an object that is pretty much inside the frost line would be nothing but rock. And yet Ceres has been shown to have significant amount of ice, perhaps even subsurface water. What's going on? How can that be? Well. It has different minerals, as it says here, with ammonia that show it could not form inside the frost line. So you know where I'm going. This implies that it likely formed in the outer solar system and is one of the leftover objects that Jupiter threw inwardly. So again, you can see why we go revisit these objects. Certainly we wanna learn about the object, no question, but you can see how what we learn, it, gives us greater insight into bigger things, the story of our solar system. How it seems likely now that these objects in the outer solar system, some of them still may be here in the inner solar system. Well, we have covered a lot of ground as I usually do. Where do we go from here? You might be thinking, okay, so which model's correct? Well, probably both of them. Scientists are becoming more and more confident that these models make sense, they explain what we've seen. I wanna finish with these final few comments. You may have heard me say something similar before. In all of science, scientists continue to learn more, obviously, that's why we do it. Well, as with all of science, the story of our solar system will also continue to become clear. We are learning so much right now that we didn't know 20, 60, 100 years ago, and that will continue. This is why we do science, this is why we develop theories and test them. Some theories are disproven, but some are improved. Remember we saw that with the nebular theory? We now have a better theory that explains more about not only our solar system, but others. 
And so, as I just mentioned, as we learn about the various objects, various parts you could say of our solar system, it improves our understanding of the whole. It allows us to build better models that explain more and are more in line with what actually happened. Studies of other solar systems are helping inform our study of ours. And so again, science progresses in this manner. So as I like to say sometimes, stay tuned for the next exciting developments, story of our solar system. Thank you very much for being with us tonight. Hope you enjoyed that presentation. We'll take just a brief pause here for Miranda and then we're gonna take some questions. Fantastic. What a great presentation. Thank you so much, Professor Dal Santo, for such an informative presentation. And so now I am going to go ahead and unlock our chat uh, function. So if anyone has any questions, please feel free to go ahead using your chat function. Uh, the, it should be at the bottom of your Zoom platform. Go ahead and we can start with questions. Um, and I do know that uh, Professor Dal Santo did explain the extrasolar planets. So what I'll do is I'll go ahead and use that. I'll upload Upload that link into the chat feature as well so everyone can review that at a later time. I'll do that right now. And Miranda, um, our viewers can also see a number of other presentations there. They've now been moved to the COD YouTube channel, so watch for that. I always say the easiest way is if you just go type my name into YouTube, you should find these. These are previous presentations. And some of you already know that I also have developed, for those of you that cannot take a college astronomy course, there are some short courses that I've developed, one on the solar system, one on stars and galaxies. These are 30 to 40 minute lectures and basically give you a whole comprehensive picture of these two topics. So hope you enjoy those. If you go out to YouTube, you can find those as well. All right, so maybe you're looking at this background picture a little differently now than when we started <laughs> out. Hopefully you've got a little more understanding, a little more insight. So let me go ahead and take a look and see what we have in our chat room here for questions. Looks like we have one that just came in, Joe. Okay, hold on a second here. I'm not seeing it. I knew there was one, let me do this. Um, let me open that up to everyone. There we go. I knew I had one that was even asked before the presentation. So let me take that one. I don't see the other ones yet here. My dear wife had asked me, knowing that I've been working on this presentation. <laughs> That's perfect. Yes. And so uh, she said, you know, so in your presentation, you mentioned about the moons of the Jovian planets and how they formed around that. And well, you know, there's, there's really no big moons in the inner solar system with one exception, right? I, I highlighted that, the moon orbiting Earth. How did the moon form? It's a good question. And I wanna start by emphasizing, again, we don't see that typically around the other terrestrial worlds, do we? So, or is this a special case? Now, I will say this, when we look at Mars, even our moon and Mercury, we don't see the surface of Venus very well, but they show evidence, not only of a lot of smaller impacts, as I described earlier, but of a few big ones. You go outside at night and look up at the moon sometimes through your binoculars, you'll see those dark areas. That's where there were some big impacts that, for lack of a better term, melted the surface, okay? Mars has a huge impact scar, Mercury has. So in other words, there were some pretty large impacts early in the solar system, but most of those, what you might think of as kind of a vertical impact, the object pretty much came straight down. What we think may have well happened to the Earth is Earth suffered very, very early in its history, a huge impact, but at a much shallower angle. In other words, it didn't just leave a giant crater, but it literally disrupted a significant amount of material from Earth. So Earth gradually, of course, recovered, but this material then was thrown into orbit around Earth, a significant amount of material. Now, if that sounds a little bit unlikely, again, I emphasize we see evidence of huge impacts on the other objects. And this theory especially gained great support when our astronauts brought rocks back from the moon. When they compared those moon rocks to earth rocks, they fell into line very nicely with the composition and the age and the history of the rocks that made this theory uh, very attractive. So this is kind of our current 
current understanding or currently accepted theory, a lot of support. We've been working through some of the details, but essentially a huge impact very early in Earth's history, we think gave us our nice big moon. Okay, let me scroll down again and see, I'm not seeing any Miranda. I don't know if you see any you wanna to read to me. I don't see any here, let's see. Absolutely. So you answered the moon. Uh, what does the grand tech idea mean for the formation of life on Earth? Oh, good question. Let me start by saying I'm not a biologist and I can't get into great detail on that. You saw that grand tech model would have occurred fairly early, very early in the solar system, likely before life ever began on Earth. So we're pretty safe there because there would have been, of course, great disruption. We can imagine Earth's orbit may well likely have been affected to some degree. So the good news is, again, that that would have happened very early. And even if light had begun or been established, wouldn't have had a great effect on it. Okay, Perfect. for some reason I'm just not seeing them. So I'm gonna ask you to go ahead and- Absolutely, no problem. Share so those. Have, yeah, so the next question we have is how big is our galaxy? Uh, one of our participants' daughter is interested to know if you can provide an estimate on the number of planet, planet, planets expected to be found in the Milky Way. Well, that's an interesting question. So I think I heard how big is the Milky Way. The Milky Way, we have to use a different unit, a light year to measure its size. That's how far light travels in a year. It's pretty big, six trillion miles, okay? But the Milky Way is 100,000 light years across. So I want you to go home for homework and multiply 100,000 by six trillion and see how many miles that is. It's a big number. As far as how many planets there are, that's interesting too. It, weighs right in what we said earlier about extrasolar planets. Mm -hmm. I can tell you that after about 25 years now, in just very round numbers, very approximate numbers, we have found on average, and I stress on average, approximately one planet per star in the Milky Way. Now, there's probably around 200 billion stars in the Milky Way. Many of those stars don't have any planets, but many have more than one, just as ours does. So we long suspected that, and we now see a very rich, what do you want to call it, tapestry of Milky Way stars and planets. Many people are very interested and very excited. Well, are there any like Earth? It would seem almost inevitable that there would be some like Earth in size and distance from their star, those kind of things. Who knows, maybe one day we can go visit them. That's great. Uh, and another question we have, uh, does Jupiter protect Earth from getting hit a lot by things? That is a great question. And the short answer is yes. Great. And the reason we know that is because in recent years, we've seen objects hit Jupiter. Some of you might remember back in 1994, there was a comet heading towards the sun that was foolish enough to get close to Jupiter. And Jupiter is a pretty big, massive planet. So first of all, it broke the comet apart. Mm -hmm. And when the pieces swung around the sun and came back, they crashed into Jupiter. It was pretty spectacular if you want to go look that up. But interestingly, just in the last few years, astronomers have gotten better at noticing small objects crashing into Jupiter. So this is a good thing for us. <laughs> this is fewer objects that could possibly crash into us. And that probably makes our planet better protected than it would be without a Jupiter. Yeah, that's a nice thing to have that, isn't it? Perfect. Uh, we have a few more. If a gaseous planet is displaced to a new orbit within the frost zone, will it ultimately melt with ongoing exposure to higher temperatures? That's a good question. I like that one. Again, the short answer is yes. Let me just comment that uh, astronomers are well aware of that and looking for that. Now understand we can't really see those planets around other stars very clearly, but we do have solid evidence indicating this is happening to at least one we know. How, how can that be happening? Well, think of it this way. As hot Jupiter gets too close to its star, and the one I'm describing is quite close, yes, it's gonna start vaporizing. As it's vaporizing, it's gonna lose mass. Mm -hmm. It's gonna lose mass, it's gonna lose some of its angular momentum, it's gonna spiral in even closer. So you can probably get the idea it's going to accelerate its fall towards the star and its orbital period will change. That we can measure. We can measure how long it takes the planet to orbit the star. We have found at least one whose orbital period is declining. 
that's pretty good evidence that that thing is being vaporized. It won't technically melt into a liquid. That won't happen in space, but it will, again, vaporize. So good question. Thank you. Perfect. So the next question we have is, can a planet move from one solar system to another nearby solar system? Well, that is possible, but I would not recommend it. Okay, um, here's why. You heard me describe certainly the possibility that one planet could interact with another. One could be thrown inwardly pretty significantly and one could be thrown outwardly. In fact, there's some talk now, astronomer that I've had the pleasure of meeting, Mike Brown is looking for planet nine. Maybe you've heard about planet nine. We think it's very possible this planet did get thrown out much farther than the planets you and I know about. It's very difficult to try to find it, but that's a possibility. Could it be flung out of the solar system? Yes, absolutely. Could it enter another one? That's a lot harder. That's a lot harder. The planet would have to approach a star slow enough for the star to capture it with its gravity. And that's pretty unlikely. It's not impossible, but it's pretty unlikely. Interesting side note I'll finish with, we have now seen two objects race through our solar system, small objects, not planets. When we calculate their orbits, they're moving much too fast to be part of our solar system. In other words, the sun's gravity is not keeping them in the solar system. We're pretty sure those are now interstellar objects from another star that's visiting our solar system. Kind of cool to think about that. Very, very much so. Uh, we just have a few more questions, Joe. Is the universe expanding from a center is, an, is one question that we have. Well, the short answer is no. And that one's kind of hard to visualize, isn't it? We're used to something expanding out from somewhere. But in my other lectures, I talk a little bit about the expansion of the universe. What you want to try to visualize, and it's, again, it's hard to do because we often have this we often immediately think of looking at the universe and watching it expand. You can't do that. We're inside the universe. So you can't be outside the universe and watch it expand and go, well, there's the middle. It doesn't work like that. We're in the universe. When the universe began its expansion long ago, the Big Bang, this is really kind of strange to think about. The Big Bang happened everywhere in the universe. Mm -hmm. It's just the universe was much smaller. Okay, so it didn't happen somewhere in space. It happened in all of space. And that's what's, that's what's really hard to grasp. So the short answer is, no, there's not really a center to the universe, but it is expanding. Perfect. Um, our last question we have here from Lisa and Rick is, if gaseous planets migrate close to a star, do they eventually lose their gases? And what is their ultimate fate? <laughs> yeah, I touched on this a little bit in that other uh, comment. It's, it's, it's a similar situation. Yeah, if a gaseous planet, again, for either of those reasons we discussed, gradually falls closer and closer, as I said, it's going to certainly heat up. By the way, we have ways of measuring the temperatures of those planets. Sometimes we simply calculate it, but other times we can get a rough measurement. And so, yeah, they're going to slowly vaporize. As I said, they're going to slowly lose mass, and they can spiral inwardly based on the rate at which they're spiraling and we can get a pretty good idea how long they're gonna last and it's not forever. So in other words, they could gradually spiral in towards their sun. Of course, they're probably gonna be pretty much vaporized before they get there, but uh, you never know what might survive and fall into the star. Perfect, thank you for that. Joe, do you have time for one more question? Sure, no problem. All right, so our last question here is from Chris Bailey. Will planets be destroyed by their sun at the end of their life cycle, or is it possible for a planet to drift out into outer space? Another interesting question. Thank you, Chris. There's a couple different um, possibilities there. So normally, again, as I've said, we think of our solar system. It is very stable now. I keep, I keep reassuring you. Planets are in very solid orbits. But I think what you may be referring to is we know that over long periods of time, stars cannot last forever. They are changing one element to another to make energy. They're going to run out of those elements. They're not going to be able to make as much energy. They're going to change. And for a lot of you that know this, often they expand, then they shed some of their outer layers, then they contract. They go through changes. 
And obviously that's not gonna be a good thing for planets, is it? You can picture one possibility again, if a star were to expand, it could engulf planets, yeah. That could happen. If our sun someday were to expand, it could engulf Mercury, for example, just use that example. Other stars we've actually found that have gone through all of those stages and they've ejected their outer layers. All that's left is a very small, hot core. We have found planets still circling. In other words, planets can also survive all the changes of the star. But here's the final part, I think, to your question. A third possibility is if indeed the star ejects enough of its matter, yes, its gravitational attraction will not be great enough to hold on to all the planets. Some planets could then be lost to, to interstellar space. So a lot of interesting things can happen as we're learning. That was where I touched on a little bit today. We're finding so many different types of solar systems. We're learning so much. We're seeing such variety that we never imagined you know, 30, 50 years ago. Thanks for that one. That's great. And that's all for our questions, Joe, aside from the kudos that you are receiving in our chat box to it being an overall lovely presentation. Um, so I think that's it for all of our questions tonight. All right. We, thank you for coming this wonderful yes. evening, everyone. Thanks to all for coming. Hope to see you again in the